Yeah. Oh, <laughs> summer, baby. How do you know? Well, thanks for the Yeah. Well, we were in Sydney. Uh, up north. Uh, All right. Before you guys get too out of hand, we should get started. Ooh. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Todd Harrison, senior fellow here at CSPA. Uh, and uh, thanks for uh, accommodating our construction that's going on in a different conference room than we normally use. Uh, I'll remind you all that we are streaming this live on the web, uh, but only folks in the room will be able to ask questions. Folks on the web uh, will just be able to watch uh, passively, and a uh, recording of this will be up on the web afterwards as well uh, if you need to go back and consult it. Uh, so today we're releasing uh, two reports, two volumes. Uh, the uh, FY 2015 uh, analysis uh, of the defense budget, and also a separate volume that we produced this year called the FY 2015 Weapons Systems Factbook uh, that contains a lot of detailed information uh, about acquisition programs and our long-term funding that DOD is currently projecting. Uh, we've also got available today a copy of a report uh, that I released last week uh, it's published in Strategic Studies Quarterly called Rethinking Readiness. I'm actually going to touch on a little of all of these uh, in the uh, briefing today. Uh, as we go along, since uh, we're all friends here, uh, if you've got questions uh, as I go along, please feel free to raise your hand and chime in, uh, and I can address those as we go. Uh, so I'll start with an overview of what's in the 2015 budget request that is related to defense. So all of the defense-related funding, if you will in the budget. Of course, we've got the Department of Defense base budget, discretionary and mandatory. A lot of folks forget that there actually is uh, some mandatory funding in DOD's uh, appropriations. Mandatory just means that it does not require an annual appropriation by Congress. It's effectively on autopilot. The vast majority of the DOD mandatory funding is something called concurrent receipt. Uh, that's a benefit for military personnel uh, who have retired and are also receiving a veteran's disability pension. It used to be that the amount of your military retirement pay was deducted by the amount of your VA disability pension, uh, but concurrent receipt means you can receive both of them concurrently now. Uh, that additional, the additional cost of that is a little over $6 billion a year that's paid for out of a mandatory account. We'll talk about that a bit more when we get to military compensation. Um, also, uh, DOD's uh, got its Overseas Contingency Operations uh, budget request. That is separate than the base budget. That is considered separately by Congress. It does not count against the budget caps. Now, in addition to that, uh, there is about $19 billion in funding for atomic energy programs, uh, about $8 billion in funding for defense-related activities and other agencies in the government. Uh, these are all defense-related things funding for nuclear weapons, maintenance of nuclear uh, reactors on our ships uh, are funded out of these other accounts. They're clearly defense related. They're not in the DOD budget though. They are part of what in budget terms is called the national defense budget function. So that totals $588 billion in this year's request, discretionary and mandatory funding. Now outside of the national defense budget, uh, we've got about $161 billion in funding for veterans benefits and services. Now this is a consequence of folks who are serving in the military or have served in the military in the past. It includes things like the GI Bill, uh, you know, education benefits like that, as well as disability pensions for veterans, uh, veterans health care, uh, a number of items are funded in their veterans housing. Now if you dig a little deeper in the budget, there are other things that are paid out of the treasury uh, or we see as lost revenue to the Treasury that are not accounted for in DOD's budget either. Uh, the first two lines you see here, uh, Treasury payments to the Military Retirement Trust Fund and the Retiree Health Care Fund, these cover unfunded liabilities for retirement and health care benefits. Basically, DOD in the past, for reasons not of its own making, did not set aside enough uh, to pay future benefits for military retirees for both retirement pension and health care. Uh, as a result, uh, the Treasury has to set aside uh, $73 billion and $3.4 billion each year right now to cover that future unfunded liability. So this is an annual transfer within the Treasury into these trust fund accounts. This is a consequence of military retirement health care benefits. Also, military personnel receive a number of tax exemptions, a total 3.2 billion in lost revenue to the Treasury. 
These are just exemptions from federal taxes. It does not include exemptions from state taxes. Uh, also, veterans benefits, uh, many of those are exempted from taxes as well. That's $7.1 in lost revenue. You total all of this up, defense-related funding, and the total federal budget uh, is $846.1 billion, uh, as I've accounted for it here, uh, not including things like Homeland Security, not including things like Foreign <coughs> and National Affairs budget, uh, just looking at things that are really defense-related, a consequence of us having a military. Now, in this report, I'm going to focus mainly on the DOD-based discretionary budget. In particular, I'm going to be looking out uh, at the five-year plan quite a bit. I'll touch on towards the end uh, the OCO budget, looking at what's in there as well. Um, but most of the other parts of this I'm not going to cover in the briefing. Uh, they're covered in the full report. So to, to get into things, I think it's important <coughs> to start with some context. Uh, the president's budget. Uh, and the Budget Control Act caps have evolved over time. And how did we get to the point that we are today with the FY 2015 request? Well, the last budget that was submitted by the administration before the Budget Control Act was enacted was the FY 2012 President's Budget Request. That you can see here uh, it showed some growth uh, in the defense budget, and this is all adjusted for inflation, uh, getting up to about $600 billion and then leveling out over the remainder. This is the 10-year forecast they came out with at that time. Uh, now, that came out in the spring of 2011. In August of 2011, Congress enacted the Budget Control Act, and that set uh, caps for defense spending. And this is the share of the budget caps that applies to DOD's base budget. Uh, and again, I'm only looking at base budget here. More funding is considered separately. Um, but uh, when they set these caps, uh, the difference you see here between what DOD was planning at the time in PB12, and what the caps would allow is about a trillion dollars over 10 years. So it was about a trillion dollars less than what DOD was planning over 10 years. Um, then they also set up a law so that these caps would not go into enforcement until the middle, uh, towards the middle, of FY13. So that would be January of 2013 before the caps would actually go into a force enforcement. So that was about 17 months from when they enacted it to when it would actually go into enforcement. That was going to give Congress some breathing room, some time uh, to, uh, to try to find some other way of reducing the deficit. Uh, now, in the interim, the president came out in the spring of 2012. So before the caps actually got into enforcement, the president came out with the 2013 budget request. And it basically split the difference between these two. Uh, so it cut about $500 billion over a 10-year period. Uh, and what DOD was planning to spend, but it did not go all the way down to the BCA budget caps level. It was still about $500 billion above the caps over the 10-year period. Now, just before the caps were going to go into effect in January of 2013, uh, Congress struck a deal, and they modified the caps. They raised the caps slightly for 2013, as you can show here, uh, but then they paid for that by lowering the cap in 2014 and doing some other stuff in the tax code. Uh, now. They, the other thing they did at this time is they delayed enforcement by another two months. So it wasn't going to be until March that the caps would go into enforcement. In that interim period, uh, the administration came out with the 2014 budget request. You can see the request also did not conform to the budget cap level. It was still above it, but they did make some cuts relative to the PB13 level. Most of those cuts were backloaded. They were out in the out years, you can see here. Now, sequestration ultimately did go into effect in 2013, in March of 2013, uh, but it did not cut the budget. You can see here the black line for the actual. It didn't cut it down all the way to the, uh, the budget cap level for 2013. Why not? There are various exemptions and exceptions built into the law uh, that meant DOD did not have to cut as much uh, as the caps mandated. Most of those exceptions, though, only apply to FY13. They won't apply in the future if we have another sequester order. Um, now, before uh, sequestration could go into a, effect again in 2014, uh, Congress put their thinking hats on after the government shutdown last year, uh, and in December of last year, they modified the budget caps again. What did they do? It's shown in the red line here. They raised the cap for 2014, uh, and they raised it a little for 2015, but they left the budget caps alone for 2016 and beyond. Now, some people like to oversimplify this and say that they suspended sequestration for two years. That's not the case. They raised the budget caps 
as long as Congress does not appropriate above the budget cap, you won't have a sequester. And it looks like, well, they didn't appropriate above it in 2014. It looks like they're not going to appropriate above the cap in 2015, so we won't have a sequester. But if they did appropriate above the budget cap, we would have a sequester in 2014 or 2015. They did not suspend that. They just raised the budget cap. 2016, they left the cap alone, so it's still at the lower level. Uh, and that's where people are concerned, and there's still not an agreement on how do we, uh, how are we going to accommodate for that. Now, I would point out that where we are in 2014, uh, the DOD, the actual enacted budget in 2014, uh, <clears throat> has already fallen by 12% when you adjust for inflation from the peak that we experienced in 2010. Uh, it's a 21% reduction if you include uh, the reduction in OCO funding that's happened over the same time. So all of this sets the context for the 2015 budget request. Uh, you can see here in the green line, DOD submitted a budget this year that meets the cap level for 2015, but it exceeds the cap in 2016 uh, and in the subsequent years, although the gap narrows in the later years. It gets closer to the budget cap level. Now, unlike 2014, when DOD made cuts in their program this year, the cuts were actually front-loaded. Right? To meet the budget cap level for 2015, they had to make a lot of cuts in 2015, um, but they did not cut as much in 2016 and beyond. Uh, so the question here, of course, is how much can we trust uh, this forecast? The budget analysis I'm about to show you based on the PB15 uh, budget and projection, how much can we actually trust it? Uh, the answer is about as much as we can normally trust it, the FIDA. What this chart shows uh, the dashed lines are the five-year budget projections mm -hmm. submitted with each budget request by administrations going back to the Carter administration. The black line is the actual amount of funding appropriated by Congress. So you can see uh, in the last downturn, starting in fiscal year 86, the Reagan administration in the red dashed lines there, they were continuing to submit budget requests that showed a growing defense budget year after year, even while the budget was in decline. We actually had five budget submissions that were showing growth in defense while the budget was in decline from FY86 to FY90. Uh, it wasn't until the second budget of the Bush 41 administration that DOD actually started planning for a declining budget. And even then, the budget declined more than they were planning for. So I, we're in a similar situation, although not as exaggerated right now, that the uh, orange line, dash lines you see here, those are the Obama administration's six budget requests. Uh, and they have shown uh, in each year higher level of defense spending than Congress has actually been willing to appropriate. Uh, they are coming down, but even the most recent, the FY15 budget, still shows that next year, in 2016, uh, the budget is supposed to grow. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, why is it useful uh, to analyze the five-year projection, the future year's defense program, the fight? Why is it useful to analyze it? Well, it's useful because this gives us some indication of what the department is assuming in terms of future levels of funding. And I think more importantly, it helps us understand the degree to which the current program of record uh, is at risk because of the assumptions they're making about funding. So let's look at the five-year projection. Uh, and one of the things <coughs> it does is gives us an insight into the priorities uh, within the Defense Department's planning. Uh, this shows a breakout by the services uh, shares of the budget, and I've shown this as a percentage change in the services budget from the FY14 level. So you can see in FY14, uh, folks tend to go down a little because the budget in real terms is dropping by about 1.7%. Uh, Defense-wide gets cut a little more in 15, the Army uh, gets cut a little more. The Air Force is actually doing pretty good. You look out in the future years, in 2016, of course, they think the budget's going to pick back up. The Air Force gets a much greater share of the budget um, uh, than the other services. Now, I've separated out a dashed line here for the Air Force. The Air Force always likes to point out that a good chunk of their budget does not actually go to the Air Force. It's passed through classified funding uh, that presumably goes to the other government agencies that the Air Force can't control. So even if you subtract that out, uh, the dashed line shows the Air Force is actually still uh, getting a net increase in funding over the FIDA. The Army, however, is getting a net decrease in funding. Um, so what this means in terms of the services budget shares, the Army's share of the budget is going to fall from 24 to 23% by the end of FIDA, if this comes true. 
Doesn't sound like much, but that would actually be the Army's smallest share of the budget since 1959. Uh, also, defense-wide funding, uh, it's actually going to end up increasing a little over the fight up. Uh, that means defense-wide will be near the highest level it has been since the end of World War II, 20% of the budget. It's another thing to point out. Folks always like to say, oh, the services just divide up the budget a third, a third, a third. Well, they forget 20% of that is not going to end with the services. It's going to defense wide. That funds things like military health care uh, and other defense wide agencies like the Missile Defense Agency uh, and all of the uh, administrative support agencies within the Pentagon. Uh, now, the Air Force is getting a larger share of the budget overall. Um, because of these increases, the Air Force's share of the budget will grow from 27 to 28%. If you take out that pass-through funding, uh, the Air Force's the blue share of the budget uh, will go from 21.7% to 22.3%. So it's not as much of an increase when you take out uh, the non-blue pass-through funding. Now, another way of looking at this is uh, by the major titles in the budget. These are the major accounts. <clears throat> so clearly, the big winner here is procurement, shown in the green line. Procurement is going to get a net increase of funding uh, almost 20% higher by the end of the FIDA if this budget were to hold true. RDT&E, that's your research and development funding, uh, it grows in 2016 but basically flattens out by the end of the FIDA. It'll be at roughly the same level it is today. Operation and maintenance funding, shown here on the dark blue line, uh, that's going to grow in 2016. That's part of the projection. And then basically stay flat at that higher level through the rest of the FIDA. Um, military construction and family housing funding, you see a sharp drop in 2015, it picks back up a little and then declines a little. Uh, it looks like a huge change, but this is actually a small dollar amount overall. Uh, we're only talking about seven to eight billion dollars a year. Uh, and so, you know, dollar-wise, it's not a big change. Uh, I'll talk about why that's going on uh, more in a minute. Um, but what I'm going to do now is step through each of these major areas of the budget and talk about what's going on in them over the FIDEF and what assumptions are built into this budget. I'll start with military compensation. <clears throat> so military compensation as a share of DOD's base budget uh, has held steady at about a third of the budget over the 2000s. So you can see here on the, uh, the chart on the left hand side. Uh, now folks like to point this out and say, oh, well see compensation costs haven't been growing. Well, this metric actually masks what's really been happening. It has stayed at about a third of the budget. It, it started to increase a bit more than a third of the budget in recent years. <clears throat> but what that doesn't show you is that it was a third of the budget while the overall budget was growing. From FY 98 to fiscal year 2010, when the budget peaked, uh, the total DOD budget grew by 61% in real terms. And so what this is telling you is that compensation costs grew at about the same rate because they seem to stay about a third of the budget. What it also doesn't show you is that the number of personnel in the military did not grow by 61%. It grew by 2% over that time period. So a better way of looking at this to understand how much compensation costs have been growing is the cost per person. So what I've broken out here is the cost per active duty service member. Uh, and this is adjusted for inflation. When you look at it that way, <clears throat> you realize that compensation costs have actually grown from 1998, the last low point in the budget, to FY14, the currently enacted budget, compensation costs on a per person basis grew by 76% above inflation. Significant growth uh, over that time period. Now, I get a lot of questions about how do you calculate that because DOD does not produce a calculation like that of the cost per active service member. They like to average together active and guard and reserve personnel, so you're averaging full time people and part time people, so it doesn't give you a good number. Um, how do I calculate that? All the details are shown in Appendix 2 of the report. So if anyone wants to know, the calculations in Appendix 2 and all the numbers are there uh, for you to check my math if you'd like. Um, now, I would also point out that the growth you see here <clears throat> does not include all of that personnel related funding outside of the DOD budget. I'm only including what's inside the DOD budget. Not including veterans, benefits, and services, which grew from about $100 billion a year at the start of the Obama administration to $160 billion a year now, and they're going to continue growing in the future. Uh, it does not include the unfunded liabilities for retirement and health care. It doesn't include the tax exemptions. Just looking at what's funded out of the DOD budget. Yes, sir? So what does it include? <coughs> what's in, what do you mean by compensation? So compensation here, uh, when I'm calculating the cost per active service member, I'm including uh, pay, basic pay for active service members, 
I'm including allowances for housing and subsistence as cash compensation as well. I'm including health care, which I would note, most of the health care costs are not in the MILPERS account in the budget. They're actually in operation and maintenance. So I'm taking those out of o and I'm putting those costs in here. That's about $30 billion a year. Um, I'm also including uh, your uh, other types of pays, special pays and things. I'm not including uh, special pays there due to deployments because of Iraq or Afghanistan. So the special pays that were funded in the OCO budget are not included here, only looking at base budget. Um, I'm also, in this calculation, I'm not including in-kind benefits military personnel receive. So I'm not including the commissaries, which basically subsidize groceries. That's not included here. That's $1.4 billion a year right now. I'm not including the uh, DOD-run uh, K-12 through schools as special schools for uh, military personnel, their children, uh, on some military basis. I'm not including child care, subsidized child care DOD provides. I'm not including the income benefits. Uh, so basically just looking at cash compensation, uh, deferred benefits like health care, uh, retirement, uh, and uh, you know, non-cash benefits like immediate health care, free health care for dependents, things like that. Uh, the other thing I would point out, the dashed lines you see here, the dotted lines, are what's in the FY15 fight. So that's what they're projecting in this budget request. Uh, now, these assume a lot of things. So it assumes that DOD will get all of the compensation reform proposed in the budget. That actually adds up to about $31 billion in savings over the five-year period. It means uh, lower pay rates. Instead of a 1.8% pay raise, uh, folks will get a 1% pay raise. It means that the allowance for housing, uh, instead of covering 100% of housing costs in the market area, it will cover 95%. Uh, it means that, you know, that another, a number of other uh, health care uh, in particular would change. Uh, they would increase the cost sharing for military retirees and dependents uh, of changes proposed in health care and consolidate all the TRICARE plans into one plan, uh, make it easier to administer and predict the cost in the future. That assumes that Congress passes all of this. And as you're all well aware, Congress is not likely to pass all of that. So they're not likely to get all of those uh, changes. It also assumes that DOD will reduce the number of personnel. And in particular, uh, the Army uh, is set to reduce number of personnel down to, in the active Army, it'll come down to about 420,000 by the end of this five-year projection. That is different than what was briefed in the 2014 QDR. 2014 QDR says that the President's budget requested level would fund the Army at 440 to 450,000 in industry. It should tip you off right away uh, that when they give a range, that that's not something you can budget for. <laughs> you can't budget for a range of 440 to 450,000. What's actually budgeted for is 420,000. Uh, and they're saying that if they get relief from the budget caps, they will come back and add that funding for personnel later. Similar thing happens with the Marine Corps. Um, the QDR says we should go 182,000 active Marine Corps. The budget takes the Marine Corps down to 175,000. So those reductions in personnel uh, mean that compensation costs as a share of the budget will decline more towards the historical norm, about 33%. Uh, and the reduction uh, in big reforms in military compensation means that the cost per person, uh, the growth will slow considerably in the coming years. <clears throat> the other the next section of the budget I want to look at are your O&M costs. Um, this is commonly referred to as readiness, although uh, readiness really includes a lot of other things as well. Uh, but this funds things like you know, peacetime deployments, presence activities, training, maintenance of equipment, uh, buying some supplies. Uh, O&M funding, if you look back over time, uh, it has grown uh, at a fairly steady rate. Now, you do see a blip here in the FY91. That's the first Gulf War. Um, you had, obviously, higher operational costs. That was later reimbursed by Gulf nations, but it went into a different account uh, when it got reimbursed, so it doesn't show up here. Uh, it was corrected for that. Um, now, I've separated out, the, in the orange line, includes the war-related O&M funding over the past decade or so for Iraq and Afghanistan. But if you just look at the blue line, the base budget only, you see a pretty steady growth over time. Uh, over the past 20 years, uh, and this is normalized for the size of the force, O&M cost per person in the active force has grown pretty steadily at about 2.9% above inflation for the past 20 years. Now, in the FY15 FIDAP, uh, they project a little higher growth, especially in 2016, 
uh, when and funding is supposed to come back up. We're trying to recover readiness, is what the department says. Uh, but this ends up being a compound annual growth rate of about 3% above inflation over the fire. Now, despite that increase in O&M funding, the department still reports uh, that readiness funding does not meet requirements over the fire. So <clears throat> just as an example, uh, depot maintenance for the Army is funded at 74% of requirements. Uh, depot maintenance for the Navy and Marine Corps is at 80% of requirements and 78% for the Air Force. They've also uh, said that flying hours, uh, op tempo, steaming days are also not funded uh, at the full level of requirements. Uh, but the point I make uh, in the readiness report that we released last week, Rethinking Readiness, uh, is that these measures of readiness don't really tell us much about actual readiness. They tell us that the inputs to readiness have been reduced because things like training, flying hours, things like maintenance, uh, those are all inputs to readiness. They help your force be ready, but they are not an actual measure of readiness of your forces, of how forces uh, are able to perform uh, in realistic combat situations. <clears throat> uh, so what this creates, and one of the things to point out in the Rethinking Readiness Report, is a, search, a, cir a circular logic of readiness, where we're using inputs to justify inputs. We're basically saying that, hey, our inputs to readiness are underfunded, therefore we need more funding for inputs. But what the department is not able to show is how readiness itself, the actual measures of performance of the military, have been declined uh, as a result. Now, to give you a better example, a fighter squadron, um, a readiness input into a fighter squadron would be flying hours, giving them time to fly in practice. A readiness output measure would be for example, average bomb miss distances. When they do training exercises and they try to drop bombs, on average, how far do they miss? That would be a measure of performance. Instead of reporting how many flying hours they had, DOD needs to be reporting things like average bomb miss distances. Uh, and those need to be tied to strategy. They need to be relevant to the task and the missions assigned to units uh, through the strategy. But they can do this, and they already actually measure a lot of this. They just don't aggregate it and report it to Congress. What they report to Congress, and the quarterly readiness reports to Congress, if you look at 20-something items that they report, they're all measures of inputs. None of them are actual measures of readiness outputs. Um, the other thing DOD needs to do, if they want to justify the inputs they need for readiness, not only do they need to measure the outputs, they need to show the causal relationship between inputs and outputs. If I increase my flying hours by some amount, or if I decrease my flying hours by some amount, how does it actually affect average bomb miss distance, for example? To do that, you would actually need to conduct controlled experiments. That's something to date they have not done, at least not on a wide scale basis. So I actually argue the readiness situation is worse than most people think. It's worse because we don't know how bad it is, or how bad it may be. <laughs> uh, and I think that's actually worse than knowing how bad your readiness is. Not knowing uh, creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty. I think that's why people in the Pentagon are legitimately worried about readiness. We are cutting the inputs. Uh, we know that when you cut the inputs, the output should suffer, but we don't have a good way of showing that, of quantifying it. Yeah. Have we ever done So there are some examples. I use a, uh, an example in this paper of my colleague John Stillian. Uh, it was actually his uh, PhD uh, dissertation that ran. Uh, where he went through and he found a natural experiment, which is not a direct substitute for a controlled experiment, but he found a natural experiment in an Air Force fighter squadron where their uh, flying hours were cut. And specifically, their training in air-to-air -air combat missions uh, was, was cut. Now, that was due to the fact that at the time they were that squadron deployed to uh, conduct uh, operations in the no-fly zone in Iraq back in the late 90s. Uh, but what he found is there was an interesting... Uh, drop off in uh, the performance of the pilots in uh, air to air missile engagements. They had a much greater likelihood, <clears throat> much greater likelihood of firing an invalid missile, basically a missile that would not have likely reached its target when they did not have training within the past 10 days. So, what that showed, the natural experiment showed that readiness for that particular task of a fighter pilot may actually depend on very recent training. What it also showed is that readiness was able to be recovered quite quickly. 
If you give people a few training runs, then they regain the ability and their performance improves quickly. Uh, so that if, if you could then confirm that through a controlled experiment, you may realize that, hey, we don't need to keep these guys at a high state of readiness all the time. If this is true, you could wait until a conflict appears to be imminent and give them training just in the last few days because that's all that really matters for this particular type of skill. Give them training in the last few days and they'll be just as ready to go into combat. So as long as you have a few days warning, you don't need to keep them at a high state of readiness all the time. Well, is what um, you know, you're admitting flying now is so you know, increasingly all the services, you know, flying services are using simulators to uh, substitute for uh, for real stick you know, air time. And, uh, so That's the, something we can, input, yeah. input measurement may even be further skewed. Well, yeah, and so we need to do we need to do contract, conduct controlled experiments to understand are simulators actually an effective substitute for real life flying. Uh, also, as we buy different types of weapon systems, unmanned systems, with increasing levels of automation, how do we even think about readiness for those systems? An automated system doesn't need regular practice to maintain its skills. The skills are hard-coded. They're in the software. It needs testing, uh, but once you've tested it and proven it under certain set of circumstances, it will continue to perform the way it's programmed to perform. How do we even think about rating this in the future with these types of automated systems? So I think, I think that's why we really need to take a different approach uh, to understanding how we measure readiness uh, and also how we understand how we measure the relationship between inputs and outputs. We won't belabor the point much more. We actually have a briefing uh, on that report next week on the Hill uh, that I'm sure you're all invited to. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, next area of the budget I want to look at is acquisition funding. Now, as shown in this chart, uh, procurement in blue, rdt and &E funding in orange, uh, they clearly are cyclic with the overall budget. Uh, the humps you see on the left-hand side are from the 80s buildup and drawdown. You can see that procurement funding really spiked. Uh, that buildup was different from the current budget cycle because it was focused on buying lots of new equipment. We bought equipment in large quantities. Uh, during the early uh, 80s. RDT and &E funding went up as well, but it did not increase by quite as much <clears throat> as we saw procurement funding increase. Now, if you look at the most recent budget cycle in the 2000s, uh, and I've separated out here procurement funding and RDT and &E funding in the dashed line that was OCO uh, funded, so it's funded through supplemental bills for Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, you see the procurement funding did spike again, but much of that growth was actually due to OCO-related procurements. These are things like MRAP vehicles that we bought, Predators and Reaper, UAVs. A lot of munitions were purchased out of OCO funding. Not much of the rdt &E funding uh, has been in OCO. There's been some for uh, JAIDO, the Joint IED uh, Office, <coughs> trying to you know, develop new technologies to help uh, detect and neutralize IEDs. But not a lot of rdt &E funding there in OCO. Procurement, though, has been heavily reliant on OCO funding. Uh, but what we find here is this budget cycle, while we did see an increase in acquisition funding, it appears to be largely a hollow buildup. And what I mean by that uh, is a lot of the systems we bought in the 1980s, uh, we've had them in our inventory for decades now, and in the 2000s we were supposed to replace a lot of them. They're getting old, aging out, supposed to buy new systems to replace them. We did start a number of new programs in the 2000s, but as I've covered in previous briefings, many of those programs failed. Things like future combat systems uh, spent $18 billion and the program was canceled. They did not actually uh, upgrade the Army's ground vehicle fleet as it was supposed to. Uh, other programs, like the F-22, for example, were cut short. Uh, so it did not fully replace uh, the fleet of aircraft it was supposed to replace. Uh, and the OCO funding procurements, uh, much of that was going to items that we're not actually going to keep in our inventory anyway. Things like MRAP vehicles uh, that we have not brought back from Iraq or Afghanistan, in some cases we've destroyed them. Uh, at least one MRAP vehicle we have bombed in Iraq now uh, because ISIS took it. <laughs> um, so a lot of that procurement funding went to things that aren't going to be in our inventory in the future anyway. And we did not fully recapitalize the systems that we had bought in the 1980s that we were supposed to recapitalize. Now, what you see in the fight up the last five years here out through FY19 uh, is procurement funding, as I showed you before, is supposed to increase. It'll actually, uh, by FY19, it's supposed to go up 
to about the same level it was at the peak of this buildup in 2010, just looking at the base budget part of it. Um, that is contingent, though, on DOD getting $116 billion above the budget caps over the FIAP. It's also contingent on DOD being able to retire the legacy weapon systems it wants to retire to help fund this and to get the other reforms, like compensation reform, that it would need to fund these. And all of the efficiency savings and everything that are already baked into the budget, uh, all of those things, all the stars would have to align for DOD to get the funding to actually increase procurement as shown here. So this is an intent. It's not necessarily the reality of what will happen. <clears throat> it's almost certainly not the reality of what will happen. Now, where is that acquisition funding going? Uh, now, this uh, the separate volume we're putting out, we actually used to do a shorter version of this in the annual budget analysis, showing uh, major acquisition programs and what was planned, what the current status was. Um, Jacob Cohn took the lead on this this year. Uh, he stayed in the back of the room. Uh, and we actually put together a much more expansive volume, so big we couldn't include it in the main report. Uh, looking at 76 major acquisition programs that are in the DOD program of record. Um, and so this covers all of what's going on in those. The data, the budget data in it, for the most part, unless it's otherwise noted, comes from the December 2013 selected acquisition reports uh, put out by DOD. Uh, we actually used a FOIA request to get the detailed year-by-year -year data that you can see in the charts. Uh, so this shows the uh, funding that's currently projected for these programs all the way up to the end of the plan program. It's so like the F-35, it shows funding all the way out to the 2030s. <clears throat> now, this graph here just shows the top 20 programs by the total acquisition funding plan. Uh, on the blue hand, on the left-hand side in blue bars, that's the sunk cost, what we've already spent on these programs uh, in FY14 and earlier. Uh, the orange part of the bar uh, is what is planned from FY15 to FY19. That's the, the FIDA. The green bar is what's planned beyond the FIDA. Now, I have to point out uh, that some of the programs, if you look at the details, they don't project what we know is coming for the program in the future. BMDS, Ballistic Missile Defense Systems, they actually show no funding beyond the FIDA. They do this every year in the SAR. They show that there's no funding beyond the FIDA, and when they release the update next year, they show one more year of funding, uh, but only to the end of the FIDA. There will be funding for BMDS beyond the FIDA, probably in the tune of $10 billion a year. Uh, so there should be a big green bar there, but it's not in DOD's SAR. It's not in the program record. Do you know why that is? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't have a good reason for why they don't ever show funding beyond that. Is that the only example that you can think of where uh, we don't know what, what's coming up? Well, there are a couple other examples. Um, so the Virginia class subs, SSN, uh, it shows no more procurements after FY19, but you look at the Navy's 30-year uh, shipbuilding plan, we are going to continue buying attack subs beyond FY19. It's just not officially in the program of record. Uh, in the so, In the SAR, right. Uh, so it's not in their long-term plan as of now. DDG-51 is similar. They don't show any. We're not buying any destroyers after FY19. That's not true. We will be buying destroyers in the future. Uh, the uh, forward class carrier, it only shows that we're buying three carriers total. We know that we'll continue. If we want to maintain either 10 or 11 carriers in the fleet, we will have to keep replacing carriers uh, every five or six years uh, into the future. So we know there will be more carriers to come, but it's not showing in the SAR right now. So that's a caveat here. Some of these programs, we know there's more to them, but it's not in the SAR. Yeah. If, if you're the F-35 program and you look at that chart, do you worry that because you are such a big dominant uh, taker of all the acquisition dollars that they're just going to keep stretching it out just so they can find everything else? Would, would that, should they be worried about that? Short answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is you know really the intention of this chart is to show the F-35 is the big elephant in the room. If I were to show the other uh, 56 acquisition programs that we've got in this book, it would stretch way down below the floor. Uh, they're all tiny little slivers of a bar. Uh, the F-35 is a dominant program. Uh, and so I think when you're looking at acquisition funding in the future, it's got a big target on it. Um, I will say this about the program, though. It is to the point now that we are likely past any major cost overruns. We'll probably have a few small ones here and there. Uh, but all the cost overruns we've already seen for the most part, I think. Uh, the program is in a point where it's probably pretty stable funding. 
I should also note that when I'm doing the comparison here across these programs, because some of these programs, the time periods are vastly different. Some of that DDG 51 funding was back in the 80s. Some of that F35 funding is in the 2030s. So if you make a fair comparison, I adjusted it all to 2015 dollars. When DOD puts out their SAR summary table and they compare all the total program costs, they do not adjust for inflation. So they, you can't make a comparison between program costs there. So I've done the adjustment for inflation. That's why the F35 is actually, the bar looks smaller here uh, than it would if you just looked at DOD's then year numbers. Um, <clears throat> So I, I, that's something that's noted in the report. But uh, yeah, question. Uh, yeah, a question on the uh, there's also a concern about obviously a higher placement for the Navy, you know, LRSB for the Air Force. And, you know how uh, how much at risk are they? I know they're extremely high priority, but there's really no explanation of how they're going to get paid for. It. So you know what's you know what's kind of the future there? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought those up. That was going to be my next point. It's a little asterisk by those two programs. Note that they are not actually included in the Selected Acquisition Report. So DOD has not actually put out uh, to Congress their formal cost estimates for these programs. So the numbers you see here are our estimates based on what the services have said about the programs uh, and projecting out when those costs are likely to occur over the coming years uh, so we can get uh, the the fair uh, comparison here with other programs. So those two programs are big, as you can see. Uh, you know, they're, pro they're number five and number six in terms of total acquisition uh, projected for those programs. Um, you know, I, I would say that, yeah, they are at risk because they're going to need a lot of funding. Uh, Colin wrote a story about this this morning. <laughs> that they are going to need a lot of funding in the coming years. Um, you know, the LRSB, as it ramps up, uh, and starts to transition from R&D into procurement in the early 2020s, uh, it's going to be competing with programs like the F-35A within the Air Force's budget. The KC-46 uh, <coughs> replacement It's going to even be competing with the C-130J, which I don't even think made it onto this list, but for the Air Force, that's a major program. Ohio replacement, of course, uh, when it really shifts over into procurement in the 2020s, it will be competing with the... Uh, the uh, attack subs, SSNs, it will be competing with destroyers, it will be competing with carriers, it will be competing with LCS, uh, as well as all the other programs uh, in the DOD uh, acquisition portfolio. So how are they going to make room for all of these programs? The real crunch time is not even in the FIDA. The real crunch time for all these programs is going to be in the 2020s, uh, because we did not do a lot of the recapitalization that was planned in the 2000s. Uh, we're not able to do it right now, but we're starting some of the big programs we think we're going to need in the future. The big bills are going to come due in the 2020s. There's a lot of uncertainty about when we have the funding at that time to do it. You've done great work on that before talking about the bow wave that's coming. I'm curious, though, do we have an idea as to how big, bigger, different that bow wave is than the one that was talked about in the 80s and then yeah. in the early 90s? It, it's, a, it's a perpetual thing in DOD planning. Uh, is that you always end up with this value. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, lots of requirements, so-called requirements, things that you want to have. Um, but the budget reality only occurs in the FIP when you actually have to meet uh, budget constraints that are given to you by uh, the department, by OMB, uh, by Congress. Uh, so in the fit up we see that things are constrained. Outside the fit up the green bars here are where things are essentially unconstrained. Uh, I can't say that the bow wave is, is any worse than it's always been. I mean, even if you looked in the 2000s when the defense budget was growing year after year, uh, we still had a bow wave. Um, so, you know, I, I'd have to go back and run some numbers and see is it really any worse than it is now. But, you know, my intuition tells me it's not that much worse. It's a perpetual problem in defense planning. So if you can't fit it in the fight up, you push it out to outside the fight up rather than give it up completely. Uh, so another quick question on Ohio and the LRSB. Do you, are you using the, uh, the Navy and the Air Force's projections on how much it costs? People, you know, they, a lot of people said they're yeah. pretty conservative and that they might go well beyond that. Which is uh, often, uh, you know. I, I largely am. Um, so for the LRSB, and this is explained in the text if you want a more detailed explanation. For the LRSB, um, what we're assuming here is the Air Force's projected unit cost procurement, average procurement unit cost, over 100 aircraft, $550 million a copy, in 2010 dollars. Those are all the caveats you have to get. <laughs> and that actually came out in the Air Force's uh, press release when they put out the RFP back in July. Uh, 
um, they stated all of that. For the R&D cost of developing the, the platform, I'm using what is actually budgeted in the FIDEP, um, which I think has about $10 billion is budgeted in the FIDEP. Uh, and then I'm assuming that ramps up our ET&E funding, and then I'm assuming basically a symmetric ramp down uh, in the years that follow. Uh, so you end up, I forget the exact number, it's over $20 billion uh, in total development funding. Uh, and then when you take the average procurement cost, you apply a learning curve, so you've got a higher cost at first. The more you build, uh, the cheaper they get, but it averages out to $550 million on copy in $2010. You then inflate that to future year dollars. Um, that's how I get the projection there. Now, do I think they'll really be able to buy it for $550 million on copy? No, I don't. <laughs> but that's what they think. Uh, so I'm putting it up there. Ohio replacement, uh, I think I'm actually, on Ohio replacement, I'm a little bit above the Navy's uh, unit cost there, uh, but not much. Uh, for those ships, uh, and again, you know, for what's in the FIDEP, I'm using what's actually in the in the FIDEP. Uh, for beyond the FIDEP is where I'm going to make some projections. For the fielding schedule for uh, the uh, for the Ohio replacement, I'm using what's in the Navy shipbuilding plan when those subs are planned for procurement. So, what's your LRSB estimate? <laughs> uh, you know, a good rule of thumb uh, is unit cost will probably be 50 percent or more about what they're currently projected. Uh, development costs will probably go up by 20 to 50 percent as well. Uh, that's just nothing, you know, not a bad mark on the Air Force or not a bad mark on the program. That's just looking at acquisition history of buying brand new aircraft that are very sophisticated, uh, particularly stealthy aircraft. Uh, also, we're not likely to buy the full quantity that we plan right now. That's just a reality. We have not bought the full quantity of the F-22. Um, we have not bought, you know, probably not going to buy the full quantity of the F-35, I think most people would admit, at least in private. So the LRSB, uh, I think it would be lucky uh, to get 80 aircraft in the future. Not to say that we don't need it, but that's the reality, is these programs tend to be trimmed. They tend to overrun costs, uh, and they tend to get cut back. What are your thoughts, similarly, with the uh, Ohio replacement program? <clears throat> I mean, do you feel that that's inside the Navy's budget? <laughs> Well, so the Navy has been you know, very forthcoming about this, that they can't fit it in their current shipbuilding budget um, with the constraints that they've got right now. So they will either need to rob money from other programs within the Navy or rob money from other services uh, in order to do that. The whole idea of putting it in a separate account uh, you know, that is outside the Navy's budget, that's, that's basically an accounting gimmick, to be honest. Uh, the money is still coming from somewhere. It's either coming from within the Navy, within the Navy shipbuilding budget, or from the other services. So the bottom line is, yeah, they're going to have trouble squeezing that in. Now, you know, is it a priority? I think it absolutely is. You know, you look at the role of the Ohio class subs, the SSBNs. Uh, they are the the sub leg of the nuclear triad. They are the most survivable leg of the nuclear triad. I, my personal opinion, as long as we have any nuclear weapons in our inventory. Uh, which President Obama has said will be for the rest of our lifetimes, uh, we will have a sub leg of our nuclear triad. So I think we will fund this program one way or the other. Uh, will it be delayed? Possibly. Uh, that does have an impact on the size of the fleet in the 2030s and beyond as the existing subs reach the end of their life. Uh, but I think one way or another we're going to fund that program. You know, I think actually the same is true with the LRSB. We've got to have a replacement bomber. Uh, at some point. So I think one way or another, we will fund the program. It may cost more than we're projecting. We may not buy as many as we're projecting, but one way or another, I think that that program's funding wedge is going to get wedged in there. Yeah. Um, Frank Kendall yesterday, he was asked about the U class, you know, the Navy U class and, you know, the standoff with Congress. And his response was, I believe, he said, well, that, that really speaks to how dif difficult it is to and fund these programs in this budget environment. And it sounded like he was implying that they don't really have a good uh, a good grasp on, on the estimate, the cost estimate. So what do you read into that? Do you think that you know this is going to be more difficult to, to start new programs? Um, and and what, yeah. what's going to happen? It, it is. Uh, and you know, that's a good, I'm glad you brought up the U class because you don't see it here. Right. Uh, and even in the, you know, 76 major acquisition programs, it doesn't show up because it's not a program really yet. They haven't finalized what the requirements are going to be, uh, and that's going to have a huge impact on what the cost will be for that program. So it, it's a new start program. It will be in addition to everything you see here. How are they going to wedge that in? You know, 
The reality is that we're in a budget environment where it's a zero-sum game. If you want to put something else in, something has to come out. And in fact, I would argue that since this, this fight up, the budget request, and the bow wave after it, uh, are probably higher than we will actually get in funding in the future years, it's actually a negative sum game. So <laughs> anything you put in just means that you're going to have to cut more than you are already going to have to cut. So it's, I think it's a very difficult environment for new start programs. But that's why it's so important, uh, the work that uh, DOD is doing right now to prioritize what capabilities they want to invest in for the future. Uh, and the work, I think, uh, is being led by the, the Deputy Secretary Bob Work, looking at competitive strategies for the future and how that should inform uh, the R&D funding that we're spending right now and the new programs we're starting right now. That's why it's so critical. It's because we've got to be careful uh, about what programs we do choose to put in the funding plan in the future, and what programs are lower priority that can come up, that can come out. There's not room for error in this. So, do you think the current crisis uh, in Iraq and Syria, the new hawkishness move, um, and a little in both parties, might change some of Congress's sensitivity? Uh, it's possible. I think it's too soon to tell. <clears throat> you know, part of it depends on how much does it escalate, uh, how involved do we get. You know, it's you know Iraq, it's Syria, it's Ukraine, it's various hotspots in Africa, uh, from Somalia to Libya, all over Mali. Um, you know, and the what had been the strategic focus uh, in the Pacific, and, you know, the rising power of China, uh, the potential incursions, uh, you know, territories uh, that are disputed by some of our allies in the region. So, you know, I think it's too soon to tell if world events um, and the you know increasingly unstable security environment are actually going to impact the budget debate. You know, I like to point out to people, we were at ComDef yesterday, I was on a panel discussion there, um, and you know, I like to point out to people that you go back to the Budget Control Act and the budget caps that were put in place, those really had nothing to do with defense spending. I mean, it was, it, the caps did apply to defense, but that was not the reason that Congress put the spending caps in place. It wasn't that people sat around and said, oh, you know, we want to change our national security strategy. Uh, we think we're spending too much money on defense, therefore we'll put these budget caps in place. No, it was about the deficit. It was about the debate over how do we reduce the deficit. Uh, and the, as Vago pointed out yesterday in the panel, the urgent issue in August of 2011 was how do we avoid reaching the debt ceiling? <laughs> you know, uh, And that's why we got the spending caps in place. It was supposed to be a forcing function to get Congress to find some other way to address the long-term deficit. You know, and the analogy I like to use is uh, basically both political parties uh, in that budget standoff took the defense budget as a hostage, thinking that the other guy uh, would not want that hostage to be harmed. The problem, though, is when both people take both sides take the same hostage, it doesn't turn out well for the hostage, <laughs> uh, and it hasn't turned out well for the hostage, I don't think. Uh, so we've really stumbled into this, and you know, I think politically. It hasn't, the defense budget has been cut, but it hasn't been cut because people wanted to cut the defense budget. It's been cut because they couldn't agree to anything else, and they had this automatic mechanism put in law, and they couldn't figure out how to you know, turn it off. They tweaked it, but they haven't been able to turn it off. So if, if the defense budget is declining for reasons not related to defense, I think it's going to be hard for the defense budget to increase because of things that are related to defense. Uh, so it's too soon to tell, but... I don't see a lot of movement right now in Congress. So, I mean, given everything you just said, is there anything has can be doing right now to sort of prevent that 2020 style wave that you're talking about, or is it really sort of out of their control and the you know, budget committee or whoever else needs to be the one to save them? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> well, yeah, so obviously, you know, Congress has got some work it could do, low hanging fruit are the basic reforms. Uh, that many of them DOD has proposed year after year. You know, Congress likes to focus on acquisition reform, and that's great, and they should. There's a lot that could be done to reform the way we buy weapons systems to reduce their costs in the future. Um, but we've been trying to do that for decades without a lot of success. So I would not, I would not pin my future uh, on acquisition reform being the silver bullet. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, but what Congress can do that really would have a big impact are things like compensation reform. That would help reduce that value wave in the future by freeing up funds. And the thing about compensation reform is uh, you know, the cha small changes you make now have a very large budgetary impact 
in five to ten years. Things you can do now, like changing the retirement system only for new people entering the service, won't actually change the budget situation that much in the next few years because it's only going to apply to new people entering the service. But 10, 15, 20 years from now, it will have a large budgetary impact because the majority of the force at that time will be new people under the new system. Um, so those are things they could be doing now. Uh, base closures is another good one. It actually will cost you some money up front, but it will start saving you money in the long term. Uh, those are things they can do uh, to help actually reduce the effect of that bow wave that don't require changing defense strategy or giving up security commitments or anything like that. Um, now, you know, the other thing you can do, kind of getting to the conclusion here of the report, uh, is we could actually, if we're going to have to live within these budget constraints, we could actually change our strategy. We could adjust our strategy to something that we can afford within the budget constraints that looks like we're going to have in the future. That may mean uh, you know, coming up with more innovative uh, concepts for how we will conduct missions uh, and, and achieve our strategic objectives around the world. Uh, it also may mean shedding priorities uh, and divesting ourselves of some security commitments in the future. Um, you know, that's going to be painful and uncomfortable, and people aren't going to like it. But that is one way uh, to reduce the bow wave, is to reduce what we're expecting the Department of Defense to do in the future. Uh, and then you could adjust the defense program uh, accordingly uh, and get rid of some weapon systems, some large development support structure. Also, retirements of uh, legacy force structure. You know, Colin, you brought up the A-10. Um, you know, my question for people is, I, I understand the A-10 is a great platform. It served us well. But eventually, we're going to retire, right? Someday, we will retire the A-10. So when is the question? The sooner you retire it, the more money you save, the more savings you accumulate. We know we're going to retire it in the next five to 10 years anyway. You would save more by retiring it now. Uh, that's just a budgetary reality. And yeah, you know, there's some risk always uh, in retiring a weapon system that may turn out that you wish you had it in the coming years. But I think that's a risk that's tolerable, that's mit that we can mitigate with other platforms that we already have and we're already using for similar missions right now. Yes? Um, how is a possible larger Iraq campaign uh, affecting the 2015 um, planning or spending? Or how will, it, how will it affect spending? Yeah, so you know, it depends on what we actually end up doing in Iraq and Syria. Uh, the air operations, uh, I've talked to several of you, you know, recently about this, the air operations that we're conducting right now, you know, order of magnitude are much less expensive than what we're doing in Afghanistan. In 2014, we're averaging spending about $1.3 billion per week in Afghanistan. That's a billion with a B. <laughs> uh, in Iraq, we're talking about spending tens of millions per week uh, for the air operations right now. Um, when Admiral Kirby is spending $75 million a day. What's that? $75 million a day is what Kirby said. 7.5. 75. So I thought it was 7.5. 7, no, he said 75 million. 7.5. You're right. 7. It was 7.5 million. Yeah, yeah. million per day. Well, that's per day. Yeah. Per day. Yeah. Now, I believe that they're also including in that estimate um, arms that we're providing to the Iraqi military. I mean, we've been shipping over hundreds of Hellfire missiles. I understand the uh, factory that makes them has been working around the clock. As fast as they can make Hellfires, we're building them and shipping them to Iraq. That's included in there as well, so that's not really our operations. That's support of the Iraqi government and their operations against ISIS. Uh, and it's not clear, um, you know, for understandable classification reasons, exactly what we're doing on the ground right now and how large of our involvement, how large our involvement on the ground is right now in Afghanistan. Uh, presumably, the folks that we do have are relatively small footprint, like special operations forces and advisors. Uh, who are there, you know, helping collect intelligence and helping work with our, our partners uh, in that region. Um, but, you know, it depends on how much do we grow that involvement. If we actually got to the point that we we're putting, you know, boots on the ground, what we typically call boots on the ground, uh, which are your regular uh, ground forces, your regular Army, regular Marine Corps, um, then we have a, a decent idea of what that would cost because we just spent more than a decade uh, operating boots on the ground in Iraq. Uh, and if you look at over the course of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, we average spending about $600,000 per year per troop deployed in Iraq. Uh, that's about half, actually, what we're spending in Afghanistan, by the way. 
Uh, so I would say that's a good starting point to estimate. If we really put boots on the ground, thousands, tens of thousands of troops back into Iraq, uh, that's a good way of estimating uh, roughly what it would be. About 600K per person per year uh, in Iraq for your regular forces. Is that, is that affecting planning or any type of projection? Well, so the, the Secretary of Defense, Chuck Engel, has said that it may affect uh, their 2015 OCO funding. Mm -hmm. Now, also, I'll get to the OCO funding in a second, but they've already included uh, 5 billion total, 4 billion of it for DOD, and this counterterrorism partnerships fund, which I think would be used for operations to counter terrorists like ISIS. Um, you know, that amount of funding, if they allocated it for the type of air operations and limited ground operations they're conducting now in Iraq, should be sufficient uh, in 2015. If they ramp that up, or if there's more going on than we know, uh, then, yeah, they may have to come back uh, and ask for more funding. Certainly, if we put regular troops on the ground, boots on the ground in the thousands, tens of thousands, then we will definitely need more funding for Iraq. Can I just follow up on that 7.5 number? That was, Kirby explained that as that's an average per day of what we've spent since the day that he announced it from the beginning of operations, I think, yeah, in, in June. In June, June. Yeah, right. How long do you think we can keep using that number to represent? Our, our presence there, because it does seem as though that's increasing, right? Because maybe yeah. that would mean that that average would also increase. I don't think we know enough from that number to be able to say. Yeah. Um, you know, the number that I did, that I came up with, about $100 million, was the cost of air operations over the course of, I guess it was about four weeks at the time I did that. That was just air operations that started on August 8th. Um, the air operations, I think, it probably cost us about $100 million, you know, for that four-week time period, starting August 8th. Um, he was including ground operations and apparently arms shipments as well. Um, so we don't know all the details of what level we were doing that going back to June. Um, so I think it's hard to know if that would go up or down. Just don't know what's in his number. Uh, yeah, can I ask you, um, the new fiscal year begins in a couple of weeks. And I think that the way the Murray Ryan deal was structured last year, a lot of us tend to rope in like, you know, FY14, FY15, you know, the, the, the caps are, are, are lifted, and then 2016 is, is the big... Uh, the caps aren't lifted. Come, I know. <laughs> the right. caps are still there. But to, to oversimplify it wrongly, perhaps. But um, is there anything, like my question for you, is there anything, you know, new or noteworthy about the beginning of FY15 <coughs> that's going to be different from FY14? Is any of these things we're going to talk we're talking about in terms of personnel and acquisitions um, does anything have to uh, change as a result of the way the laws and the budgets are structured? Yeah, so the start of fiscal year, October 1st, um, at this point, it's virtually certain we will start on a continuing resolution. Um, this year is a bit easier to start on a continuing resolution because what's in the FY15 budget request uh, is roughly the same level of funding that was in FY14 already. And a continuing resolution just carries you over at the same level of funding. So I don't think a CR, at least for the first three months of FY15, will be all that disruptive. Um, and that, that it looks like that's what's likely to happen. Uh, as long as Congress comes back and passes a full year appropriations bill, um, you know, later, you know, in January or so, um, then it should not be that big of a disruption. Uh, you remember back at the start of the fiscal year last year, we did not get a CR passed in time, and we had the government shutdown on the lapse in appropriations, as budget chairs like to call it. <laughs> um, we're, you know, we're not looking at that. You know, neither political party wants a government shutdown a month before the election. Uh, so I think we're likely to see a, a relatively uneventful CR you know, to start the fiscal year. And also, in previous years in the CR, um, many times they have included an OCO appropriation of war supplemental. This just equal to what the president requested for that year, not continuing at the previous year level. Uh, because you know, this year, in 2014, the OCO funding level was $85 billion. This year, the requested level was $59 billion. Um, so I think they're likely to go ahead and give them the OCO at the new level and we'll work out the details later. I'm just not exactly clear when you said we could adjust our strategy to the budget constraints. I mean, it would it would possibly make sense if the threats were decreasing as our budget starts to. I'm not up. saying it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you could, if yeah. you could just uh, ex explain that, because even with, with some of the threats from uh, traditional state actors, you're looking at real big ticket items like nuclear modernization. Yeah. And so, so basically, 
we're kind of at a fork in the road uh, in the strategy budget process here, right? This should be an iterative process all the time. Uh, you always have some resource constraints. Uh, in the report and the conclusion, I quote uh, uh, Bernard Brody, uh, brand strategist from back in the, the 50s, writing about this. Um, he had a chapter in one of his books called Strategy Gives a Dollar Sign uh, to emphasize the point that, yeah, you know, we always have budget constraints. Even when the budget's going up, it's not unlimited. So we always have to make tough choices. Uh, and strategy is always constrained to some extent by the fiscal resources available. I think we're at a point, though, where we've got a defense strategy that is articulated in the 2012 defense strategic guidance, uh, like it or not, uh, whether it's incomplete or not, um, that's kind of what we're operating off of, um, you know, reaffirmed in the 2014 QDR. Um, but we've got these budget constraints as well. And the defense strategic guidance uh, did not take into account the BCA budget cap. So there is that natural mismatch there already. Um, I think DOD's got the two approaches, the fork in the road they're at, is they could either start submitting a budget that fully resources that strategy, which this does not. Uh, and I'll talk about that at the end here in a second. Um, they could submit a budget that fully resources strategy and then show us the gap. Show us precisely what they think the gap is between what they need to execute the strategy at whatever they deem to be an acceptable level of risk. Uh, and what Congress has set as budget caps for defense. The other alternative is they could adjust their strategy, downsize their strategy, to fit within those budget constraints. I'm not saying that's a good idea, given the threat environment we see going around the world, all the hotspots popping up around the world. Um, but you could do that, like I said before, by shedding missions, by you know, coming up with innovative, con innovative concepts uh, for how we'll execute missions with fewer resources, basically getting smarter about how we use forces. Uh, or we could divest some security commitments. Basically, tell some allies, hey, we told you we were going to have your back, and things have changed, and we're not going to have your back. <laughs> um, we could do that, right? And then that would allow us to live within a lower level of resources, some combination of those things. Um, you know, everyone likes the, let's develop some innovative concepts uh, for how we can do more with less. So obviously, that's where you should start. Um, you know, so you may be able to do that, uh, use your forces smarter, may, maybe rebalance your capabilities within your forces, uh, and you not have to actually divest security commitments. Um, but some combination of things, you can scale back your strategy, you can adjust your strategy to fit within the budget constraints. Then you could say to Congress, look, here's the revised strategy, it fits within these budget constraints at what we deem to be an acceptable level of risk. If you don't like this strategy, Give us more money. <laughs> so sure, right? and makes me reading the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you want to see what our real defense strategy is, you don't read the documents. You look at the budget numbers, right? And what are we actually funding? Where are our priorities? Where is the money going? Um, you know, you look at things that have happened mm -hmm. recently, like the uptick in military compensation as a share of the budget going up to close to 35% of the budget. I look at that and I read that, that part of our strategy uh, is taking care of our people, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, and that's not necessarily helping us with the security environment around the world. Uh, so, you know, I, yeah, I think if you want to know what's what's likely to happen uh, in terms of U.S. defense strategy in the future, uh, yeah, you look at the numbers. You look Todd, at what we're planning. I'm oh, sorry, Todd. Are you seeing a change in emphasis either in the acquisition of the mill purse or the ONN accounts? You know, towards um, <clears throat> You know, for example, the Navy versus the Army. You know, now that the you know Iraq. And yeah. The, what you see here, the shift, you know, in emphasis between the services, mm -hmm. that shows a shift in, in strategy. I think. I think we are putting more resources, relatively, towards air power, fewer resources towards ground forces. I think that gives us some insight into what our defense strategy really is at this funding level. Now, let me. Uh, I'm going to skip through here. I know we're running up on time here. Um, so bottom line in the report here uh, is I think that this strategy resource mismatch, mismatch the gap, probably totals uh, in the 200 to $300 billion range over the five, over the next five-year period. Uh, I think that's we would probably need that much more than the BCA caps allow uh, to execute the defense program that's outlined in the 2014 QBR. And again, assuming that defense program uh, is appropriate for the strategy uh, that, we, that we have in the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance. 
Um, now, how do I arrive at that number? And I mean, we're, it's a big range here for a reason because it depends on a lot of unknowns. Uh, we do know that we're already, the 2015 budget request is $116 billion over the BCA caps over the next 15 years. We also know that the higher force levels called for in the QER uh, would require about $20 billion in additional funds beyond what's in the budget request right now. Uh, that's like funding the, uh, re the refueling of the USS George Washington so we can maintain 11 aircraft carriers in the long run. That's not actually funded in this budget request. Uh, maintaining the higher end strength for the Army and Marine Corps uh, is not actually funded in this budget request. So we need about $20 billion more just for those force levels. Uh, also, uh, as we talked about in the past, uh, OCO funding uh, has been used to supplement the base budget in recent years. Uh, I, I skipped the slide on that, but we're looking at, we've seen the OCO budget uh, be in about $35 billion excess uh, in FY14 and FY15 for what was actually needed for Afghanistan, right? What is that money being used for? Some people call it a slush fund. I don't like that term because that implies that it's being wasted or abused somehow. Uh, it's being used for legitimate military purposes. Uh, it's being used for things that used to be funded in the base budget, things like people's pay and benefits. Not the extra pay they get for being deployed, but basic pay uh, for folks in the Army and Marine Corps. Part of that is being funded out of OCO funding. Part of our peacetime presence operations uh, in CENTCOM is being funded out of the OCO funding. So it's legitimate military purposes, but it's not for Afghanistan. So what DOD's got is an OCO to base migration problem. The funding that they have been getting in OCO, uh, they're still going to need it once we're out of Afghanistan. They're going to have to migrate some amount of that back into the base budget to support the current defense program. Uh, my rough estimate, we don't have an OCO projection for the future, so I can't say with any certainty uh, how much they will actually have to migrate back in in the future. But my estimate is it's maybe 10 to 20 billion a year. Over the FIDEP, that would be 50 to 100 billion dollars. They would have to migrate in uh, just to support the current defense program. Uh, other assumptions that are built into the budget request are things that may not come true, and DOD will then have to cover that money. They need extra money for that. Compensation reform. Again, they're planning on about 31 billion in savings from compensation reform over the FIDEP. They're not likely to get every bit of that. Uh, also, a lot of efficiency savings are already built into the budget. And the last two items here, DOD does not budget for uh, acquisition costs for, for cost overruns. Typically, programs overrun their cost by 20 to 50 percent from the initial cost estimate. Um, now, many of the programs we have right now have already had many of their cost overruns, so we're probably not going to get 20 to 50 percent overruns in the future. I uh, certainly hope not, but we will get some. Costs will go up beyond what's uh, <clears throat> planned right now. And if we actually want to buy the quantities of weapons we're planning in the defense program, we will likely have to pay more for them. O&M is the same way. O&M in the past has grown more than DOD has projected. So there could be O&M cost growth to deal with. If you add all this up, uh, you know, I think a good range uh, is 200 to 300 billion over the FIDA that we would need to fully resource the strategy as relative to the VCA budget caps. <clears throat> I would like to see DOD submit that budget <laughs> and show us precisely what that would be. Yes. What I'm taking away from all this is that you can we can foresee severe cutbacks in the investment accounts in the, in the next 10 or 20 years. And the reason is, you tell me if you disagree, I know, but real quick, you know, the, the odds of them increasing the budget caps are not, not great if they increase them at all. All those efficiencies you talked about are dependent on political, you know, uh, concessions that are probably not going to be made. So, you know, whether it's base closure, you know, base closure or retiring aircraft or all the stuff that you talk about as good ideas, including a rational reassessment of our strategy. Well, we haven't done that since August 2011. What makes it, what makes us think it's going to happen in the next five years? Okay. So, all that list of things is, is places we're not going to get money. And you're outlining 200, 300 billion dollars. So, you know, isn't it true that in the past the place they've gone is the investment accounts? And should, so, should we assume we're yeah. going to see a lot fewer boomers and F-35s and and bombers, etc.? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think this shows it right here. So, the fight up is assuming they'll get 116 billion above the budget cap. And I'm saying I think they actually need more like 200 to 300 billion to fully execute the program. But just with 116 billion, how do they spend it? Procurement. That's where a lot of it went. 
Um, so if they don't get the 116 billion, what do I think will be cut? Well, they'll come from you know all of the accounts, but I think procurement is probably most at risk that we won't actually increase procurement by 20% over the FIDA as currently planned. Um, so I think that's definitely a risk. Um, so, I mean, I think DOD is at the point they've got to present a stark choice to Congress, a clear choice. Either here's what it takes to fully fund our strategy, or here's the strategy that we will have to adopt the best we can do with the budget constraints you're, you're giving us. Uh, give them that stark choice. Uh, I think that's the only way that DOD is going to be able to get Congress to either change the budget caps, lift the budget caps, or give DOD the flexibility it needs to manage within the caps, to give them the ability to reform compensation, to close spaces, to retire legacy weapon systems, to do all the things they know they need to do to get more efficient. Um, I think that's they've got to give Congress that stark choice uh, in order to, to get some movement on this. And even that, of course, may not be enough, because as I said earlier, a lot of this is driven by politics that don't really have much to do with the defense. On the weapons, the weapon, when they do have to cut the weapons, do you think they're likely to do it sort of by delays and small cuts and sort of bleed things? And Pushing it into the bow wave. Yeah. I think that's likely how they, they make the cuts in a lot of these weapon systems. Uh, is, you know, I mean, it's typically what DOD has done in the past. Uh, is you reduce the number you're procuring over the FIDEP and you assume that those other units you'll be able to buy outside the FIDEP. So you increase the bow weight as you go, uh, but eventually you don't get to buy those weapons in the bow weight. Uh, you, by the time you get to the point where you can realize you have the money to buy those weapons, you're on to the next generation system anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the continuing resolution, uh, so are there any programs that might be at risk? I mean, I, I, as, as I understand, I think the KC-46 is starting to come this year for the first, uh, first time. You have uh, maybe JLTV, I mean, any, any programs that... Yeah, one of the interesting things that comes out of this factbook um, is you go to the ground system section, there's only two programs. <laughs> two major acquisition programs for ground systems, JLTV is one of them. Um, yeah, and the requirements for JLTV, I think, are still somewhat debatable up in the air. Uh, what do we really need in terms of a, a next generation Humvee replacement, essentially? Um, so I think that program certainly is at risk, at least of delay, uh, until the Army uh, can better decide you know, what kind of capabilities does it need in the future um, for a, a Humvee replacement, and how many do they need, quite frankly. Uh, KC-46, the Air Force has been very clear that that's one of their top three acquisition priorities. You know, the F-35A, LRSB, and KC-46, uh, they do need that tanker replacement. I think that program um, is safer than most. Yeah. But, I mean, with the CR, though, does that create any sort of problems, depending on how long? I mean, it, it depends on how long the CR goes for. Um, if it's just a three-month CR, they'll be able to manage. That has become the norm now. Uh, a three-month CR. Uh, DOD is well equipped to manage within that, and I'm sure the program office is plenty equipped. If you get to something like a six month CR, then you start to have problems and you need Congress to make some exceptions uh, in the CR. Um, but we're not to that point yet. I don't know if I can handle having a budget on October 1st. I, I know, it's been, it's been a while since we had one enacted on time. Um, I don't know if you can make this comparison. In your last slide, you said that uh, DOD needed two to three uh, hundred billion dollars more over the fit up. Yeah. Um, but early on, the slide where you were showing the different P12, 13, 14 levels, that was over a decade. So to say yeah. that they need two to three hundred billion more over the fit up, does that resemble any of the previous budgets? Or it, is it, hard? it does. It comes back close to the PB13 okay. level of funding, quite frankly. Okay, so. um, which, at the time, that was uh, developed in conjunction um, with the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance. Okay. With regard to compensation, specifically <coughs> how it affects the retirement trust fund over the future, um, with the World War II generation and the Korean War generation dying off, Vietnam is getting old, uh, is there going to be a point where we reach a peak in the number of retirees and that starts to go down? Well, so let's uh, include this slide and back up. Um, we have to differentiate between veterans benefits and military retirement benefits. Military retirement benefits are funded out of the DOD budget. Veterans benefits are funded out of the VA budget, so it's not part of defense spending. This chart shows veterans uh, funding for veterans benefits and services. This is adjusted for inflation. 
uh, going back to the late 70s through uh, the FY19, the projection out uh, in, this, in this budget, you can see sharp increases uh, in veterans' benefits and services, the cost uh, in recent years. Now, a lot of people like to assume that, oh, this is because of Iraq and Afghanistan. Not true. This is, as you alluded to, this is because of Vietnam era veterans, really. Um, it's not World War II or Korea veterans, uh, those folks, you know, are reaching near the end of their life. Uh, and so the cost of, of those veterans are going down. The cost of Vietnam veterans, though, is just starting to peak. Uh, and so we, we're going to get through that peak uh, in the coming years, uh, and then we'll be looking for the peak in veterans' costs for Iraq and Afghanistan uh, era veterans. Uh, and that those costs may not peak for 30 to 40 years, quite frankly. Uh, and it's hard to predict what those costs will be because of the uh, types of injuries that we're seeing in these conflicts are different than what we've seen in previous conflicts. Many more folks are surviving uh, injuries that, you know, in the Vietnam era would have resulted in them dying on the battlefield. Uh, and so, you know, and we're seeing uh, you know, things like traumatic brain injury, we're better able to diagnose now, and PTSD as well. Um, so we've got people receiving benefits, um, whereas you know those people might not have received the benefits in the past. We've also made the benefits a bit more generous for veterans. Uh, under the Obama administration, they've expanded who qualifies for veterans benefits, which has created part of the backlog <laughs> in folks applying for benefits because so many more people now qualify. And we're doing a much better job of advertising it to folks so people know that they might qualify and know to apply. Um, part of that is just technology, uh, being able to apply over the internet, being able to get information over the internet. In terms of military retirement benefits, um, that's much more stable. We know where that's going in the future. Um, you know, that's something the DOD Office of the Actuary projects every year. We know we've got this unfunded liability that I talked about before. Um, they projected that out in the future. We are making payments on that. Uh, and you know, within the next 20 or 30 years, assuming Congress does not change the benefits um, retroactively and make them more generous to folks, uh, we should be able to pay down most of that unfunded liability. Um, but you know, that, that is all projected out by the Office of the Actuary, and that's being funded on an accrual basis in DOD's annual budget request. So, yeah. We've heard endlessly about uh, <clears throat> being at an inflection point of some kind. Um, you certainly seem to be saying that we're at an inflection point in the budget. Um, how grim is this choice uh, compared to things like the Korean War, Vietnam War, um, the end of the Cold War? Where would you rank this? You know, um, I would say we're, we're at, it's not a perfect analogy, but I think it, the period we're in right now looks more like uh, the period at the end of the Korean War, where we're coming off a major conflict that was not very popular, um, and we're recognizing that we're in a substantially different security environment than we've been in before. Uh, and we're trying to figure out you know, what should the military look like, and what should our strategy look like in this new and evolving security environment. At the end of the Korean War, we were entering into a Cold War with the Soviet Union. It ended up being a relatively stable, long-term peacetime competition between us and the Soviets. Um, and a lot of the strategy that we saw at that time, the shift in strategy, came from Eisenhower's new look at defense. And what we saw in the 50s with the new look at defense was significant shifts in the budget, and particularly the services shares of the budget. Uh, at one point in the 50s, the Air Force was getting 49% of the defense budget. That's because we had a shift in strategy to rely more on air power, strategic air power, and our missile forces. And we were buying those systems uh, to a, a large extent in the Air Force. Um, so you know, I don't think we're going to see something as significant this time around. Uh, but we are at that kind of point where we need a new look at defense and a new look at our security strategy. Uh, and how our defense program supports that strategy. What types of capabilities we need to maintain in our force? Uh, what type of forces uh, we need to maintain in the military to address the, the threats that we're seeing in the future? You know, many of these are new and evolving threats. Um, and, you know, we don't necessarily want to try to address these threats in the way that we have over the past 10 or 20 years. That means we need new capabilities. So, 
that a lot of the work that we've done in our uh, strategic choices exercises, and you guys have seen this with other think tanks on the Hill, uh, it has been centered around this idea that we need to do rebalancing of DOD capabilities. How do you rebalance in a budget constrained environment? It is possible, but you have to make some pretty difficult strategic choices. And you have to be willing to accept risk in, in areas, uh, either in time or, or in certain types of missions. You need to be able to accept a certain level of risk that's higher than what we're accepting now. Or you need more money. <laughs> now that chart, the acquisition chart, um, the uh, LCS, I imagine that's factoring in with having 20 ships. So yeah. that's going to go on once they figure on a replacement. Program. Yeah, so that, that um, the SAR projections for the LCS assume you stop after 32 ships. Yeah. So yeah, that, they're not really going to stop after 32 ships. They've indicated that they're just going to reassess at that point. They could keep buying LCS. They could buy a modified version of LCS. Or they could buy a different ship. But that green bar is certainly. Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> That's one of those where it's really not complete. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, how do you get Congress to do something? <laughs> That's a different briefing. Yeah, I don't think. My magic eight ball. I don't have the answer. All right, thank you all for coming out. Um, thank you. If you have any follow-up questions, you know how to get in touch with me.